Something that I talk about often in one way or another with my divorce coaching clients is gaslighting. Rarely do we call it that, and even more rarely does the person who's being gaslit know that that is what's happening when they're describing their stories to me. It is insidious, it is painful, and it is crazy making. And today on the Starting Over Stronger Show, we're going to open up this Pandora's box and shine a big bright light on it so you can understand it once and for all what it is, why it happens, how to respond, and what it looks like to recover from this toxic relationship dynamic. Welcome to the Starting Over Stronger Show, where you'll find help and hope for your divorce survival and recovery. Divorce well, live well. So, what is gaslighting? Well, I'm not really sure that there's a dictionary definition of it. And if there is, it probably would only have you asking more questions because there's just no easy way to summarize what gaslighting is. By its very nature and intention, it is confusing, it's senseless, and it's just really hard to define. The simplest way to explain it is that it is a psychological weapon when someone intentionally does something to confuse or alter another person's perception of reality for their own gain or perverse enjoyment. It's a form of mental, emotional, and psychological abuse, and it is intentionally inflicted on someone to make them question their sanity, to make others question their sanity, and ultimately to keep them trapped as a victim in the relationship by disabling their ability to trust in their own judgment. In 1938, Patrick Hamilton wrote a screenplay called Gaslight. Think about that for just a second. 1938. That's going on a hundred years ago. Two feature films originated from this screenplay. And in this story, the husband turns up the lights in the upper part of the house where he had murdered a woman in order to find the jewels she had been wearing. And his turning up of the lights upstairs dimmed the lights downstairs where his wife was. When she shares her concern with her husband about the lights dimming, he gaslights her by telling her that she's imagining things, that the lights have not changed. Always, when the wife notices things that she considers odd, she shares them, and he mentally manipulates her by denying the truth and telling her that she's going crazy, to the point of eventually threatening to put her in an asylum. And that, my friends, is gaslighting. And that's actually where the term came from because of that movie. And there's just so much to unpack here. But I'm just going to start with some expressions that abusers might be using often because I think that's a way that you can really easily pick up on whether or not you're experiencing this and to know exactly what it might look like. So these are some of the their favorite coin phrases. You're overreacting. You need help. I didn't do that. You're making a big deal out of nothing. You must be confused again. I haven't seen it. I never said that. Calm down. You are so oversensitive. You're overreacting. That's not even what happened. What are you even talking about? I don't have any idea what you are referring to. You are imagining things. I would never do that to you. I was just joking when, of course, you know, they weren't joking. You're always twisting everything around. Okay, so that's just some of the catchphrases that abusers who gaslight their victims like to use. Now let's talk about some of the predominant techniques that they use. 
One is, it could be called blocking or it could be called diverting. It's just simply where the abuser changes the conversation from the matter at hand to questioning the victim's thoughts about the matter at hand. It's an attempt to control the conversation so entirely that you may not even realize they just hijacked the conversation and you've totally left problem solving mode and entered entirely into gaslighting mode. You had maybe ended up in this heated debate about something going on in your family that you're just simply trying to communicate with them about to come to an understanding, to share a concern, to understand where they're coming from or or to solve an issue. And suddenly they're saying something like, you know, you always do this. You don't respect me. You overreact or you make something about you that isn't about you at all. Well, of course, your immediate gut reaction is almost a startle response internally because the shift is so unnerving and you immediately go into defense mode because your character is being attacked and it caught you totally off guard because you were just in the middle of this conversation. And it's kind of like startling when somebody jumps out from behind a tree and you're walking in the woods. It comes out of nowhere. So of course it feels like an attack. And in fact, in this case, it actually is an attack. However, Your chances of getting the abuser to return to the subject matter at hand are small to non-existent. He gaslighted you with blocking and diverting because he has no interest in dealing with the reality of whatever the issue at hand was. So going back to it, most likely will solve nothing. You'll just end up back here in the weeds again because he's not interested in reality. Another technique that gaslighters use is trivializing. This involves them making you believe that your basically your thoughts and your needs are just not important. You share a legitimate concern or feeling and he or she says something like, you're going to let something like that come between us or I cannot believe you are making this big of a deal out of that. Do you remember last month when you did fill in the blank and I just let it go? Some of the other techniques that may be used against you are lying. I mean, lying is pretty simple. A lie is a lie. You know when you're being lied to. Controlling, manipulative, and narcissistic abusers lie with great ease because they do it so damn often about everything. Sometimes even about things that are so trivial and minor that it just absolutely makes no sense whatsoever for them to even feel the need to lie about it, but they do it anyway. Another technique is countering, questioning the accuracy of your memories, basically telling you something didn't happen when you know, in fact, it did. Isolating. They challenge your credibility by causing you to question what other friends and family members think about you or covertly or overtly preventing you from spending time with your family and friends. And it sometimes happens very suddenly and very overtly, like I said, or it could be very subtle, very slow progression over a long period of time. So it's very covert and sometimes doesn't even get noticed for a very long time. Another technique is denial. Your abuser will deny the truth and make you question your own memory, your own mind, your own ability to perceive what's happening in your world and your family. Another technique is withholding, where they pretend not to understand what you're saying to them, even though you know they do. It's obvious. And they just don't want to deal with it. So they just act like they have no idea what you're talking about. Projecting is a very common technique. Gaslighters often project the things that are wrong with them or the things that they are actively doing wrong onto the person that they are manipulating. I often tell my clients, if you are being accused of cheating, I can almost promise you, you are being cheated on. And this is because they know a great deal about you. So whether it's infidelity or maybe it's addiction or something else entirely, they will accuse you of doing the very things that they are doing. 
they do this because it's like the perfect distraction technique because it makes you get off their case and start worrying about yourself instead and wondering how they came up with that and trying to defend yourself. And they get away with whatever it is that they're up to because you're now so distracted with thinking you've got to prove your innocence. But the truth is, you can know exactly what they're up to by what they accuse you of. Now, I wouldn't recommend engaging with them on this level or even telling them that you know about what this is. Because even though they literally tell on themselves, once you understand projecting, if you use this word with them or try to get them to understand it, they're just going to turn it around on you. I promise. Ask me how I know this one. Another technique, strangely enough, is niceness. And I know it sounds strange, but truly niceness is one of their most evil tools of abuse. You may have heard of Stockholm Syndrome. It's where a victim who's been freed from their abuse still craves the affection and attention of their abuser. Well, before she is freed, when her abuser is nice to her, she often becomes more loyal and more likely to believe every lie she's told and put up with every manipulation and control that she's subjected to. But typically, An abuser actually starts off very nice. You might have heard the term love bombing. That's what we're talking about here. And it's not only how they start off, but it's also a cyclical thing. So the uh, you may have heard the terminology to idealize, devalue, and discard. That happens on repeat throughout the entire relationship, but when you look at the entire relationship over the course of many years, you can also see where in the beginning there was idealization, and then they devalue you over the next period of time. And then they discard you when you wake up to the reality of the situation. So at some point, it does often happen very slowly over months or years, they begin to withdraw their affection and treat you more and more badly, often for no reason. Of course, they'll give you a lot of reasons. They'll blame you for everything. But truly, there is no reason for the change. You haven't changed at all. They're just devaluing you in preparation for a discard. And of course, this causes confusion because this is not normal human behavior. But it sets you up to seek to get that nice guy or nice girl back, believing that that was the real them and something has changed. But the really hard truth is that what you're seeing right now is the real them. It's the one you're seeing now. The nice guy was the act. Okay, enough about the abuser. What about you? What's going on for you when all this crazy making is going down? Well, here are some signs that you are experiencing or might be experiencing gaslighting. If you've got someone who's saying all the kinds of things that I just explained, and you are constantly questioning yourself, struggling to make decisions, thinking you're never good enough, feeling like everything you do is wrong. If you used to be a confident person, but now you feel like you have little to no self-esteem, you're unhappy for what you feel like is no reason. You're wondering why you're not happy, but you just can't ever get there. You feel confused easily or often. You wonder if you are too sensitive. Certainly you're being told that all the time. You make excuses for the bad behavior of this person that you love. And you feel like you deserve to be alone. Why would anybody want to put up with you? You question your own judgment in everything and over-apologize for everything to everyone all the time. I bet someone's even said to you, maybe several someones in your life have said to you, you know, you apologize for everything all the time. You don't need to do that. And then a big one is that you are hypervigilant. And hypervigilance is a big topic. I would say if you think this might be you, go spend some time 
looking it up online and reading about it because simply hypervigilance just means you don't ever relax. You feel like you have to anticipate everything so that you can be on guard. You play out all these scenarios in your mind. You probably have conversations with your abuser in your head repeatedly all day long because you're trying to rehearse what they might say and how you're going to respond. That is hypervigilance. And it is exhausting. And, you know, that actually was one of the most prevalent things that I dealt with in my own situation that became sort of the red heron for everything going on in my home, because finally, somebody in my life picked up on that and said, you know, I think I understand what's going on now, and was able to help me really identify where I needed to go for educating myself on this topic and and finding the the means and the support to end it because she helped me to realize what hypervigilance was and why I was in that trapped position of feeling like I had to rehearse my whole life and be on guard all the time. So those are some of the things that you are probably experiencing if you are being gaslighted. So here's where I really want to spend some time coping and recovering, because I don't need to marinate in this whole thing. You know, you live in it and you have for a long time. And you know, at this point in this conversation, 16 minutes in, you know if if you're being gaslighted. We've we I've shared enough now, you know. So what can you do? Well, the first step is just simply realizing that you are not crazy. The things that your abuser has been doing to make you feel crazy have really been happening. And the things that they have been saying to you about you being crazy are not true. The next step is creating space between you and your abuser. Now, this is going to look a lot of different ways for everyone. It could be physical space. It could be emotional space. And certainly there are many ways and stages of detachment, which is what we're talking about, that you are going to need to create between you and your abuser if you are going to get healthy. So physically, that could mean simply in the middle of a situation where they're trying to gaslight you that you leave the room or leave the conversation. It could mean that you physically move to a different part of the house so that you can get some space to begin to explore what is happening. It could mean that you move out. However, I do not recommend that be done rashly with you or your children. You need legal advice if you're considering that. And the other way that you can create space is simply emotionally. And that looks like not engaging in these conversations. So we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. But certainly it could easily be argued that there's no effective way to cope with gaslighting because any exposure at all is detrimental to your mental well-being. And that is true. But that being said, there are techniques that you can use to begin the process of detaching from this type of abuse. And you're going to need to employ some or all of these techniques gradually over time so that you can begin to process effective detachment from your abuser. So first of all, you have to start seeing things differently. The way you have always seen things most likely aligns with exactly the way your abuser wanted you to see things. And that has kept you stuck for how long? Isn't it about time? To admit, hasn't your gut been telling you for a very long time that something is wrong? I remember the time when I can't even think how many times I must have belabored the point with a good friend of mine about how crazy making my marriage was. I had been talking to her so many times about my marriage problems, and she was so gracious and patient with me. And and one day, it just sort of hit me. And I said, there is something fundamentally wrong with my relationship. 
I cannot put my finger on it. I don't know what it is. I don't even think I'd heard the word narcissist at this point, but I just suddenly knew this is not just your average run of the mill marriage problems. There is some serious something going on here. So reach out, read online, get books. I will be glad to provide you with a list of books. It's a very short list and they are powerful books that will change your life. Just email me uh, or reach out on the Starting Over Stronger website and I will get you connected with those. Listen to podcasts like this one. Find others that, that speak to you. Search YouTube videos. There are so many people that are doing YouTube series uh, videos on teaching people about narcissistic abuse, gaslighting, all the terms that you find online. You can also find YouTube videos about it. You have to gain new perspectives. For a very long time, you have probably believed everything that your abuser has said to you. And why wouldn't you? You're supposed to be able to believe your spouse. You would not be here listening to this today, though, if you had not begun the process of gaining a new perspective on your toxic relationship dynamics. So that being said, if you are just a regular listener and you really didn't or don't think you are being gaslighted, hey, that's great. As long as it's true. If it's true, Thank you for tuning in because you're probably here because there's somebody in your life that you care about and you see this in their life and you don't know how to help them. So what you learn here will help you in being able to help others who are facing this. So thank you. And if you aren't sure and you've made it this far into this conversation, my guess is that your spirit is being piqued. You are wondering if this might be what you have been dealing with for a long time. You've heard things that I have said thus far here in this conversation and maybe in others on this podcast that resonate deeply. And pardon my French, but probably it scares the shit out of you. And that's okay too. Hang in there. You are here to change all of that. So start with questioning everything. Don't buy the lies. Don't automatically think everything that your abuser says has to be true, that you must be wrong. It may not be wise to question them verbally to their face. And that is not what I'm suggesting anyway. I'm not suggesting when I say question everything, I'm not suggesting that you argue with them about everything. I'm talking about a mental process that you need to go through. Because of course, obviously, it could be dangerous, especially if you think your physical safety could be at risk. And, and, it, and it won't solve anything anyway. It's just going to make them more defensive and more argumentative. And, you know, you just, that's just the wrong way to go about it. And of course, many, many people do that. I was one of them. It's just natural to try to figure things out and dissect them and confront them and because you want to, you want to fix it. But if you accuse them of the very things that they are actually guilty of, gaslighting, projecting, what have you, they will do their own internet sleuthing and start using those words on you as weapons. And they will not take them to heart. They will not consider that they maybe need to change. They will not have a sudden epiphany that they have been wrong all along and you're right. That will never happen. And you have to remember that when you go into these conversations with this burning desire to tell them things, because the purpose of not buying the lies and questioning everything is not so that you can try to fix them. That's what got you into this situation. It's so that you can begin to see the truth more clearly. And so the next coping technique is just that. Start seeing the truth. Focus on the truth. Of course, you're going to waver back and forth a million times, and each time will feel just as real and just as confusing. Every time another lie is told and you're tempted to believe an absence of proof or even with evidence that there is, in fact, a lie, you're going to want to believe it. It's a trick your mind is playing on you to protect you. But you need a good therapist. You need a lot of time journaling, praying, and talking with healthy friends. 
And all of these things are slowly, little by little, going to help you to see the truth more clearly and to stay focused on the truth. Are you getting the support you need as you divorce or face the possibility of divorce? Did you know that for just $55 a month, you can be a part of a one hour weekly support group call of people just like you? Some haven't even filed yet, but they know the marriage is not sustainable or healthy. Some were served papers they didn't want. Others are feeling empowered that they finally took the reins of their life and hired an attorney and a divorce coach to help them navigate the uncertain waters of divorce. All of them are facing fear, grief, loss, confusion, and pain, and they're finding help and hope in a Starting Over Stronger support group. You can get registered today for a group at startingoverstronger.com slash groups and start this week in getting the help you need to divorce well and then live well. Remember, divorce is hard. Life after doesn't have to be, but the support you get now is what makes the difference. There are many other ways you can focus on the truth. You can find resources to read and view, such as I said earlier, books and YouTube videos. And in fact, here are my top three books that truly these three books changed my life in a way that I can't even imagine where I would be if I'd never read them. And the first one is Healing from Hidden Abuse by Shannon Thomas. The second one is Stop Caretaking the Borderliner Narcissist by Margalise Feldstad. That's spelled F-E-L-J-S-T-A-D. And then the third is Splitting, which uh, has a subtitle of Protecting Yourself While Divorcing Someone with Borderline or Narcissist Personality Disorder. And that is written by an attorney, a family law attorney named Bill Eddy. Bill Eddy also has done some amazing work on a little process called BIFF, B-I-F-F, which talks about how to positively communicate with high conflict personalities by being brief, informative, friendly, and firm. That's what BIFF stands for. So uh, you might look that up too, because that is a great resource for how to communicate well with, with someone who tries to gaslight. You can also go to YouTube and watch videos from thought leaders in the world of narcissistic abuse. There are many, and I'm not even going to name any of them because there's just so many. They are pretty much all good. You'll find some that you like better, you, that resonate more with you. But just start start searching key topics like what is a narcissist? How do I detach from a narcissist? What is gaslighting? How do I react to or respond to gaslighting? How do I set boundaries with a narcissist? And so on. And as you begin to watch these videos and read these books, they just naturally lead you into other videos and other books and you just continue to grow in knowledge. And that is the first step. You have to educate yourself before you're ever going to be able to extricate yourself from this. You can also just search online and read articles on all of this. Psychology Today has a whole bunch of articles and so many others. And the more truths that you consume, the less likely you will be to get sucked back into believing the lies. Another important way to cope well while you're still in the relationship or trying to navigate toward a potential ending is to stop defending your abuser. It's very natural because you're a loving person and you love them that when they behave badly, maybe as a parent or with friends and other family, you have probably been defending them. And, you know, he's just tired. He's just really got a stressful job. You know, one of the things that I often share with my clients is that an important part of our healing from these toxic relationships where we have been gaslit for years and years is coming to the place that we recognize, admit, and own that not only are they not who we thought they were, but 
We are partly responsible for where this relationship has devolved. We contributed to this toxic cycle by allowing them to treat us the way that they have in, in ways that we would never let a friend or a coworker uh, or another family member treat us or speak to us. And you know, the truth is, in essence, we teach other people how to treat us. And so in these relationships, we have taught them that they can mistreat us in all these ways by simply staying and allowing them to do it. Sure, we've had many factors at play that have been good reasons that we stayed. Our kids, finances, many other very, very important reasons. But the truth is that we could have left. Many, many women did in the exact same scenarios. Even if it meant that we feared losing our kids in a custody battle, and even if it meant having little or no money and we'd have to go to a shelter or live with a family member and have no idea how we're going to defend ourselves in a divorce battle, many women in those exact same shoes did leave, but we didn't. We stayed. And I did too. And this is not intended to put anyone in a place of shame. So just remove that from your mind completely. We all do what we do when we do it for reasons that are important to us at that time, because that's what we're ready for with the information and abilities that we have at that time. There's no shame in that. So do not go there. But the first step of change is to acknowledge our part. We cannot decide to do things differently until we see what it is that we've been doing that wasn't working. And we have to be able to look at that without diving into a pool of shame and losing ourselves entirely. It just is what it is. Many of us put off going there in our minds because we're so tired of feeling responsible for everything because our toxic mate blames us for every single thing that is not our fault for so long so the last thing we want to do is take responsibility for anything. But that's a trap. And in fact, I can still remember one of the most freeing moments in my years of marriage counseling was when my counselor, Sheila, convinced me finally that my refusal to apologize when I did realize there was actually something I did wrong was a part of the problem. And it was this whole cycle of shame that wasn't allowing me to do it. And she helped me to find the power and freedom to, to do that, to go, you know, he may have really hurt me too, but that thing that I did right there or that thing that I said was not okay. And I owe him an apology for that. But you know, you're powerless when you refuse to own the power that you have to choose how you're going to respond in your life. When you look at your life and you open your eyes to the choices that you have made to stay stuck, that is where all your power is. Why? Because you can't change anyone else. You can't change what anyone else does, but you can change everything that you do. You just have to see the big picture to discover your options, and then have the support system to start making some different choices, maybe very small ones at first. And this often starts, and it definitely should start, before you file for divorce and before anyone moves out. It starts with boundaries. Verbal boundaries look like no longer engaging when the abuser wants to argue or mistreat you. You have to recognize that no argument with this person will ever be won or will ever produce any kind of change on their part, most likely. They just simply love drama. They thrive on it. It's like a drug to them. So stop giving it to them. No amount of logic or persuasive debate is going to change how they act or who they are. It's only going to keep you exasperated. And that's exactly why they do it. Walk away when possible, even if it's hard at first and seems like it makes them even more mad, unless your safety physically is at risk, do not engage. 
They thrive on the drama of conflict like adrenaline junkies. And for that matter, after years of being in a toxic relationship, your own brain may actually get a rise out of it too. You may like it. Resist it. Not engaging can mean a lot of different things. It might mean, like I said earlier, you physically leave the room or you leave the house. It might mean you exit the conversation by making a phone call, texting a safe person and asking them to call you if you send them the safe word. It might mean going to a room where the kids are so that he or she will stop escalating the situation. It might mean wording your responses differently. Try this, for example, the next time your toxic person tries to make you doubt your reality, instead of letting it get you all worked up or letting it actually make you doubt your reality, say, we remember things differently and then change the subject or try something like, I hear you. That just isn't my experience. I see it differently. The idea of these kinds of neutralizing statements is to let the attacker know that you don't have to be wrong and them right. We can just both have different perspectives. And these these things need to be spoken neutrally. You know, you can say, I hear you. That just isn't the way I see it. But you can also say, I hear you. That just isn't the way I see it. That's not my experience. Same words. Very, very different tone, very different interpretation will be made from that. But the whole point is that they aren't necessarily going to love you doing this because remember, they thrive on conflict, so they want the fight. But this does give you a way to reduce the escalation and perhaps find a stopping point to end it before it becomes worse. And if not, a next step would be to exit the conversation physically by saying something like, if you continue to speak to me this way, I will not continue to have this conversation. I know my truth, and I am not debating it with you. I'm open to discussing a solution with you for this, but I am not open to being shamed, blamed, or having my feelings debated. Or simply, I'm going to have to step away from this conversation. We can try again later when emotions have calmed and when we can have it without shame, blame, and anger. Here's how I want to sum this up today. The truth is that gaslighting is wrong. It's dangerous to your mental health. And if your kids are experiencing it because they can hear you from another room or they're in the room with you, it's dangerous to their mental health. And there is a huge price that will be paid for continued exposure to it. But there is another side to the coin. And this is the hard part for those who have been subjected to gaslighting for years, maybe for a lifetime. There's only one way to stop it. You, your abuser will not stop it. Your abuser will not suddenly decide to treat you better. I know that's hard to hear. It's, any, it's even harder to believe. But the fact is that if they cared about your feelings and they truly loved you, they would never have controlled you, mistreated you, and manipulated you in these ways. And If they have, say, you fill in the blank with whatever excuses you may have been trying to hand them for years, ADHD, PTSD, post-concussion syndrome, uh, they have a stressful job, they're being attacked spiritually by Satan. I mean, the list goes on. But if they have some diagnosable condition or life circumstance alone, and that was the only thing that was the culprit for their bad behavior... They would have long ago felt so guilty for what they were subjecting you to, to, you know, the person that they were supposed to love, honor, and protect above all others. Isn't that what we said in our vows? That they would have sought a solution. They would not just continue to do it and expect you to take it. They would have taken ownership of their behavior and repaired it, or certainly they would at least be trying very hard in ways that you can see that are measurable and specific that you would know they're trying. And that would be a very different situation, but they aren't, are they? Because they don't think they're the problem. And the only person they care about is the one that they see in the mirror. I know, I know, pretty harsh. I'm sorry. It's also the straight facts. 
And around here, I don't put lipstick on pigs. And we also don't cast our pearls before the swine. We call a spade a spade. And we turn that mirror around and we take a good look in it. Why? To blame you for the abuse that you've endured? No. But yes, this is abuse. But no, not to blame you. It's not your fault. Because you know what? There is no such thing as fault. There is only responsibility. They are responsible for them, and you are responsible for you. The hard truth is that you are the only one who can end this, and you're the only one who will end this. So when will you? You will have to find your assertiveness. Think back. When's the last time you remember being assertive? When you were a 20-something, a teen, a kid? At some point in your life, even if we got to go all the way back to when you cried because you wanted a bottle, you asserted what you wanted and needed in life. How far back do you have to go to find that unwounded version of you that knew your own mind? You're not crazy. You're being abused. You maybe still are being abused if you're in that situation still. And I got to tell you what gets me out of bed every morning and lights a fire under me to work hard every day to get messages like this out in private coaching and support groups in this podcast and, and in every other way I possibly can is my absolute disgust with the injustice and pain of the millions of women and some men too who are trapped or think they are in the endless cycle of covert narcissistic abuse. And I was one of them once. I know what it is like to be the victim who's seen as the crazy one, the dramatic one. I know what it is like to be the one who feels like she literally cannot extricate herself from this nightmare because of this, that, or the other obstacle. I know how unstable you feel. I know how imbalanced it all is and how unfair it is. And I know that you sometimes lash out and act just like your abuser and then wonder if you're the narcissist. You're not. I know you live with such emotional overwhelm every single moment of every single day that there is literally nowhere for your emotions to go except on your sleeve for all the the world to see. And I know that you may have friends and family that believe your abuser when he or she tells them that you are being irrational, unstable, while they show up in public as the cool, calm, and collected everyone's favorite guy or girl. And as cruel and heartless as it may sound, it's super easy for your abuser to show up and appear stable to the world when they're not because they have never been attached to you. You are just a sickening supply of ego for them. That's why they cheat on you. It's why the second you leave, they'll be dating someone else if they're not already. It's why they can drop a divorce in your lap after 30 years together and feel absolutely nothing. It's why they can go to marriage counseling and pretend to be fixing the marriage when they're actually cheating on you and trying to make you so miserable that you file for divorce after 30 years together. It's not that they don't love you. It's that they don't love, period. They don't have the capacity for the kind of love that you have for them. It's why they can't even look you in the eye when they make love to you or when you're having an intimate conversation. They literally do not have the capacity for true human connection. Don't pity yourself, or maybe you do for a while, but don't stay there. Pity them, because you, my friend, will end this nightmare some way, somehow, someday, but they, (laughs) they will always have to live with themselves and their inability to make a real human connection and treat others well. So here's what you have to do with all this heartbreak and heartache. Turn it into assertiveness. Dig down deep. Get into therapy. 
And let me just say too here, if you have a therapist who just takes your money every week and isn't dramatically moving you closer to emotional freedom, and you have been seeing them for months or years, you need a new therapist. Talk therapy is not a hobby, and it is not a lifelong endeavor. It should be a season where you are given the safety to explore and the tools to find your way out. There should be an end in sight, and you should know the goalposts along the way. One of the most important tools you will ever use is assertiveness. So let's just define it. What is assertiveness? Let's just start with what it's not. It's not aggressive. Aggressiveness is a very different thing and a not a good thing. Assertiveness is just you being you. You showing up in the world, believing in yourself, speaking your thoughts and feelings with confidence, and maybe at first you don't really have a whole lot of confidence, but you're speaking them anyway. Fake it till you make it. Face it till you feel it. Confidence is the result of courage. It doesn't work the other way around. You don't get courage and then suddenly become confident because you were courageous. You don't get confidence and then learn to assert yourself. You learn confidence by asserting yourself. It's firm, but kind. It's you saying, this is who I am. You be you, you do you, I'll be me and do me. It's trusting yourself, listening to your gut, saying the kinds of responses that we talked about before, like, I know my truth and I'm not debating it with you. You can believe what you want. I'm going to believe what I want. And you know, there are so many benefits to being assertive. I'm just going to run through a handful of them. The more you assert yourself, the more you're going to grow in confidence. The less stress you're going to have, the more you will be able to recognize and understand your own feelings. The more you assert yourself, the better you're going to be at communicating. And that is with everyone, not just your difficult partner. The more you assert yourself, the more honest all of your relationships are going to become. And the more you're going to get respect from everyone for your authenticity, the more positive changes you're going to see in your life. And the more you assert yourself, the more you're going to feel in control of your life and your choices. As you let all this sink in, I want you to just pause a moment here. Take a deep breath. I'll do it with you. Breathe in and breathe out. Okay, now I know I get excited when I talk about all of this because I so badly want to see people freed up from this, but I don't want to overwhelm you any more than you already are. I want you to remember that there's no shame in where you are at this very moment. We are all where we were, where we are because of a series of choices that we made for reasons that were important to us at the time that we made them. And we do better when we know better. It's as simple as that. You live and you learn and you learn and you live and you take one day at a time, one moment at a time, apply what you can from our talk here today and just take one step forward. That's really all any of us can do. And if you need help taking that next step, would you consider coming and joining a Starting Over Stronger support group? They are educational, encouraging, affordable, so affirming, and we sometimes have fun in there. You're going to meet people who are wearing these same uncomfortable, worn out shoes that you are who are questioning everything, who are mad at themselves one week for what they put up with and and proud of themselves the next for what they asserted in their life and the positive results they saw from it. We're learning together one hour a week how to start putting on a new pair of shoes and taking some new steps in a direction that leads to a life you can love one step at a time. I'm here if you need me. And that's all I have for today. That's enough, right? (laughs) I'll see you again next week for more help as you divorce and hope as you are starting over stronger.